I'm Russ Kickle and welcome to American Reef. On today's show, we're going to go back in time and take a look at what I believe was the very first successful large SPS tank in America. So just a heads up, I'm actually working on editing part two of the uh, Top Shelf Aquatics video. So keep your eyes open for a video. What we're gonna do is we're gonna go actually and spend, it's probably a good hour with Kevin who designed that Top Shelf Aquatics farm that we saw on the last episode. And he's gonna do some deep dive stuff onto the filtration as well as just the overall life support systems and feeding and what he's doing to make sure all those corals grow as fast and as colorful as they possibly can. Now, as I was editing up this video for Top Shelf Aquatics, um, technology was what it was and it ended up failing. Right? So I had to do some restores of uh, some files because of the hard drive failure. And when I did that, I came across these two videos, which I do not believe you, you guys have actually seen. Basically, this was early 2000s when American Reef was just getting started. And a gentleman who had a local store that has come and gone since then helped me kind of produce these videos. And we went to go see the Penn State Reef Tank that Sanjay Yoshi that was actually in charge of and designed, maintained, etc. Right? And at the time, uh, again, this was early 2000s, um, again, this tank was rocking. It was at its best. And so Sanjay actually let us do a, a take tour and he spent a good bit of time reviewing how he was successful and why he, he was successful. So again, to me, I think it's one of those things where it's a great video so you can kind of see old school how things were done, you know, a decade ago and how they were still very much successful. And when I say one of the, you know, first successful, I truly believe one is the, the key word there, meaning that there were other ones, but it was one of them, right? Uh, and this was, again, I want to say the early 2000s. I kind of don't remember the exact time frames. But remember, at this time frame, everybody was just keeping brown sticks and corals, right? Uh, nothing very colorful like this tank that you'll see. And speaking of old school, one of the things that kind of jumped out at me as I was watching the videos are companies like Bulk Reef Supply, Premium Aquatics, right, Tunzi. They've been around forever, right? Not only since this video was produced, but well before that in the early, you know, probably the late 1900s, so to speak, to early 2000s, to even now, right? And I always make the claim that, you know, only time will prove companies and products to be good and successful. And to me, it's a very, very good validation of basically Paul Group Supply, Premium Aquatics, and Tunzi, meaning they've been around forever, they will be around forever, because, you know, ultimately they view your patronage as an honor. And uh, with that being said, they provide value, they provide quality service, and if you need any kind of reef keeping product, take a look at those guys first, because again, they help you succeed, as they helped in this particular case and through the years. Again, that is Premium Aquatics, that is Tunzi, and that is Bulk Reef Supply. And we got a new one here, where it's just Top Shelf Aquatics, so if you're looking for somebody's cool colorful coral, head on over to Top Shelf Aquatics. And with that being said, let's take a uh, look at that Penn State Reef Tank when it was rocking at its prime. Hello and welcome to another episode of American Reef. What we're going to do today is a little bit of a tank tour. We're here at Penn State University in the Student Union. We're here with the designer, Sanjay. 
Welcome to American Reef. You're welcome. Thanks for having us today. And Sanjay's going to tell us a little bit about this reef tank that was actually designed and set up in 1999. It's one of the older reef tanks of this quality that you'll ever see anywhere in the country. So Sanjay, why don't you tell us a little bit about um, some of the trials and tribulations in the beginning of the aquarium? Like, uh, first, why don't you tell us how you came about setting up an aquarium of this magnitude in this facility? Well, around 1999, the Penn State was rebuilding the hub. They were redoing the Student Union building. And one of the students approached me and asked me if I would be interested in putting together a proposal for them where they would set up an aquarium in this building. Now, did they know that you were into reef keeping at that time? Or well, they yeah, knew you they, had a big... Uh, they were talking to the local pet stores. Okay. And they directed the student to me. And that's when I got involved in it. At that time, they were thinking of setting up a 29-gallon aquarium. Nice, nice, <laughs> nice. And by the time I got through talking to them and looking at the scale of things, we figured we might as well go for a big one if you're going to do all the, all the work. So we went from together. a 29-gallon to right. how many gallons this is, is this? 500 gallons. 500 gallons, right. okay. It's a lot of water. So yeah. in order to get the funding for it, it, it came from the class gift. So actually, the students voted for this gift. Huh. Yeah, they had, the, the university actually selects three finalists, uh -huh. and the students get to vote. And I, from what I was told, this was by far one of the few gifts that had such a high percentage of votes for it. They Neat. Had like 80 plus percent of the votes Neat. for the aquarium. So, so the so class were really interested in it too. So that kind of gave us the uh, initial funding to put it together. The building was being constructed, so it was easy to construct the room that we needed and the placement of it. That was worked by the university architects. And the university gave you full kind of carte blanche on design of this aquarium. Right. Okay. Pretty much. So Sanjay, you go from a 29 gallon aquarium right. to this monstrosity. Um, you get the approval, you get the funding, the students vote for it. What ultimately do we have dimension wise? What, what do we have here? Well, then we got done with it. It's about eight feet long and, and it's three and a half feet front to back. So this is 40 inches deep. It's 42 inches. 42 deep. inches deep. Right. 42 by... I wanted 48, but we had to settle for 42. <laughs> okay. Uh, and 30 inches tall. I, you so know what? I didn't even realize that tank was 30 tall. Right. It's deceiving. It's 30 inches tall. The, the space is so big that this tank doesn't look that big. It here. doesn't. When we walked up on it originally, I thought maybe there was another tank. When you said 500 gallons, I never saw this tank in person. Right. It is deceivingly... You know, <laughs> is he right? And, and the corals are so huge right. that it shrinks the tank. Okay, so we have a 500 gallon tank. Right. The, the glass, it's made of glass. We had to go with glass because of the location and because of the fact that there'd be too many people touching the tank. And I was worried about it being scratched up and having to maintain acrylic. And you're not the only one, you know, no. we want the viewers to understand. You're right. not the only one who, you'll clean it occasionally, right. but a lot of students are involved and they, being glass, it's less susceptible to be scratched up. Right. So that was one of the reasons we had to go for glass. And then the university had concerns about the glass breaking and losing things. So we went, ultimately went with one inch thick starfire glass, with laminated starfire. So this is two half inch panes of starfire and on three sides. So the tank is viewable from three sides. Um, I'm, I don't think the back is Starfire. It didn't, doesn't really have to be. So they actually, it's Starfire, but it's two half inch glass, pieces of glass glued together. Or, or with, with a plastic laminated in between. Yeah. Never could tell. Yeah. Very interesting. Right. So Starfire is good, it's clear. Mm -hmm. Especially when you start getting the thick glass. And so we decided to go with the Starfire. I mean, really. Have you had any issues with it? No, other than a few scratches, nothing really. No other issues with the, the glass at all. So that was a good choice, Dan. It words. was a good choice. Yeah. I mean, I would, I wouldn't do a display tank like this where too many people are going to touch it. I wouldn't do it in acrylic. Right. You know, yeah. and that's really interesting because that's one decision on an aquarium this size. If they would not have consulted with you in the beginning, they would have went with acrylic. Probably. And this tank probably would be in really, really, really bad shape as far as visibility. Right. So that's Although how important. You can scratch out the scratches. Yeah, but, but you got to drain it and take everything right. out, and you know, access becomes difficult. 
That's why one projects the, like this, you have to consult with somebody who knows what they're talking about. One of the things we had to give up was access from the front. I have no access from the front of this tank. Right, right. Uh, now, did you know that going in, that you would not have access? We wanted access, but there was security concerns. I mean, you know, people could get in, throw yeah. something in there. Yeah. Uh, there's all these concerns. So we really don't have any access to it from the front. Well, the way it's Aquascape, you did a tremendous job. So when I show you at the back, you'll see the design adjustments we had to make because we had no access. This tank is four feet, almost four feet from the back. So if you're going to reach the front glass from behind, it's not easy. Right. right. It's not easy. So I'll, I'll show you what adjustments we did right. to make to make access. What you're seeing basically has is, uh, been set up about four years ago. It was redone four years ago. Not uh, redone in the sense of aquascaping and rearranging the corals. When we first set it up, it was set up in '99 where we had the whole idea of putting in two pounds per uh, gallon of water of rock. So you had a thousand had, pounds of rock in here we almost? We almost had close to 750 pounds of uh, wow. rock. Actually, we're under Fiji rock, so we may have, may, may have a little bit less even. Maybe five, six. But a massive amount. But a lot of rock. And it was all built like a wall, rock packed in. And pretty soon the coral just grew, outgrew that tank. And we started having a lot of issues with circulation at the same time uh, over the years. So four years ago, we decided that we had to do something about it, and we decided to redo the aquascaping. We used pretty much the same corals we had after we trimmed them down in size. It was amazing to pull out colonies that were that big in size. From and the back, from too, the back. without damaging them, you but, know? As, yeah. as, as well, much as you we, could. Some you, of them, yeah. we had to damage them because as corals grow, the bottom started to die out, and most of the growth is always in the top. So we had to remove a lot of that dead growth and re-aquascape the tank, and this time we re-aquascaped it in a way that we'd have better flow. That's kind of natural though, in the wild they do the same type right. thing, and that's how the reef kind of grows, right? Although the dead part stays there. Yeah, 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 it yeah, gets yeah, re yeah. It's repopulated with other things. Sure. Uh, we kind of don't have that luxury because you pretty much start running out of space. Yeah, the real estate is valuable. So as you keep these tanks, you realize that corals do get big, and you need to give them enough space to grow, and you kind of have to vision how things are going to grow. The first time we did it, you know, we ended up with putting stag horns in the front, and they grew, and you couldn't see behind. <laughs> so you, you learn a lot as you start keeping these roofs. But even though you redid this tank four years ago, you were redoing it with original corals and a lot of corals right. from the original right. setup. Right. Yeah. So That's now tell me, doing. what's the one thing now that you've redesigned the reef? What would you differ? It's four years later now, and now you can redo it. If I was to redo it again, I, I would even put even less less rock. Mm -hmm. Okay. Sure. I mean, right now you can see in four years this tank is packed. There is no space. The corals have grown huge. I may have put more space between some of the corals. Sure. Mm -hmm. as you'll see, as if you look closely, you'll see that some of the corals have shaded the other ones that are growing underneath them mm -hmm. uh, and killed off parts of it. But the corals have grown so big that it really doesn't affect anything. So part of it died, but the other parts are still growing. And you can't see the dead parts because they've been overgrown. You know, a lot of a lot of viewers, you know, still use one or two pounds of rock per gallon, and right. you know. The moral of the story is you really don't need it. Okay. You, you don't need it. So looking at the tank, one thing you learn is, you know, sloping left to right, front to back, it's boring, right? And there are also limitations. Which I mean, I think you have to look at the three-dimensional aspect of the tank. And so when we did the tank, we had basically islands created, but these islands have now all Yeah, Yeah, they, they have. You've lost. These were three. You've and lost. There was actually three, four there in there. More huh? than three, but they were, they were really kind of islands that we, we did these rocks as pillars. Mm -hmm. So we actually drilled a rock, we skewered them with a fiberglass rod, 
Mm -hmm. That way the structure is more stable. That's the other thing we learned. In the piling of the rock, every time we move coal, did something, you'll get a rock pile collapsing. Right, right. And you create more damage. So here, since the rocks are all skewered and firmly attached to a tile at the bottom, I can take out parts of the rock and still not have a collapse. Right. Is that what's on the bottom? Is a floor tile? It's not actually a floor tile. It's a paper stone from Lowe's. Oh, okay. Yeah. Neat. Kind of and that paper. gives it the weight. Yeah, to... cement paper stones. Neat. Yeah. Very it, it gives neat. The weight. And then we drill those. Stuck a fiberglass rod through there, and then we just stack the rock on the pillars. And you can't even see the rods anywhere. No, not at you all. You can't tell no. it's been built as pillars. The nice thing is you can see there's a lot of openings at the bottom. So water flow is not an issue. Fish have room to swim. Sure. Um, yeah, there's no fighting going on. Uh, you know, all the fish. No, there's occasional chasing here and there. Yeah. Fish will do. But That's normal, right? In general, I mean, you don't see ripped fins on the fish. Not at all. No. No. Now, I noticed since we're talking about the fish a little bit, I noticed uh, a few pairs of fish, especially, I don't know if Ross can get this in the camera, but one of my favorite angels that I personally have never owned or, or, or uh, had in the shop would be the banded angels. Right. One of the things as I learned myself over time was that it's much nicer to keep fish in pairs or multiples if possible. It, you get to see a much more natural behavior. If you look at the antheas, we have four, five females in here with one male. Mm -hmm. um, and he's here. obvious, the male is obviously right. different than the females. Right. And we have a trio of flame angels in here. I didn't know that. I saw. Right. I never saw three at one time. But yeah, I, so there's there are three, three in there right now. So a male and two females. Yes. Um, then we most. Then we have a pair of pairs of clownfish in here. Several pairs of clownfish. Uh, there are pairs of damsels. They spawn here in here too. So that's the advantage of having multiples of pairs. You actually see some spawning behaviors from the fish. Now the courtship and spawning. Now the banded angels, did you get very small? No, these were pretty much uh, the size we have them here right now. Um, we got them from uh, Live Aquaria up in Wisconsin. Sure. They are one of the best places, in my view at least, to get quality fish. Yeah. Now, um, did you know they were a mated pair? When yes, you bought they, them, they were they, collected as a mated pair. I don't know how they were collected, but they yeah. were sold as a mated pair. And they And I'm guessing they were collected as a mated pair. And they've held up. And they've really held up. Yeah. Uh, they're one of my favorite fish. I love those fish. You know, I noticed some really big blue or blue yellow tailed damsels, which I've always used in my reef tanks. I've always liked a few of those in there. I've never been able to keep more than a few. They always end up, I don't care how big the tank is, you end up with two or three. You right. know, you could put a dozen in there, but you end up with I two or three. The tank at home, I have four of them. There you go. That's, that's better than I, right. I've ever done. But it's a great, it's a cheap fish, but that's fantastic color in my I don't opinion. I see any, any fish that has that striking blue I agree. Color. I do. I agree. And for me, I've only gone diving on a few reefs, but they're always populated with damsels. And they're beautiful. So I like to put damsels in my reef tanks. Wow. Uh, people complain that they get aggressive, which they do, but they're not they too tank, bad. Not too bad. They don't right. harass the other fish. No. They squabble among each other and they don't seem to hurt each other. You could call them a poor man's joculator. You know? <laughs> you know, you'll pay a lot of money for a joculator angel and the color's not that different, you know? Blue and yellow. They're very striking fish. I like damsels. And I see a lot of perks. We have a lot of percula clowns. Those are actually tank raised. I raised those. Oh, you did? Yes. Those are the very first batch that I had raised. And I had a bunch of babies. And I said, I'll throw them in here. That's impressive. Golf clap. And, uh, that is. See how they do. That is awesome. So that was your first spawn? The, the first time I ever raised clownfish. Or the first time you raised them, right. not the first spawn. Right. And how old are they now? They, they probably are three or so years old. Very cool. Yeah. Very impressive.
Sanjay, I also like the effect, you know, this is obviously mainly an SPS tank, but we also have a nice variety of LPS and soft corals mixed in here. And it's like perfect because you have the SPS at the top, you have the LPS and soft corals down lower, and I, I think that just adds a nice diversity to the aquarium. Yeah, people always like to see stuff that's moving. And if you end up with a tank with only SPS, there's very little motion. And you can't forget and that, yeah. People who don't know much about corals, they always think that these are artificial. I know. Uh, so when you have things that move, then they can tend to believe that it's alive and it's moving. Uh, Especially like a giant euphilia, right. big frog spawn. You know, when that's really bloomed and flowing, right. that's always uh, a, great, a great piece of eye candy, I guess. Nice bright red lobo. These singularities just, they're fantastic. Pangea's in here, some uh, Lastamusa's in the back. Now, what do you do with a lot of, obviously you frag these corals a lot. Do you? We have, uh, we have, we have to frag at yeah. least occasionally when they start now, you, into each other and harming each other. Now, students that you know that have reef tanks or zoos, or what do you do with some of the frags out of here? Most of the times, we just give them away yeah. to students, volunteers who help out. Some of them have reef tanks at home, mm -hmm. and we'll give them frags. Sometimes we'll trade them for some other things that we might need. That's good. Uh, other frags that we might want to put in. Now, is there any SPS corals in here that you would consider very rare or uh, something that, uh, you know, you're not going to see every day? That stag is pretty I awesome. Mean, not really. These are pretty much, there's nothing really that rare in here. Now, a lot of the stuff you got kind of colored up as it evolved too, right? right. You know, it yes. didn't necessarily look like that when you got it. No, oftentimes you get them, most of these are from frags anyway to begin with. Right? Nice. First, we first had the tank, we got a few wild colonies, and then a lot of the frags came from my own tank at home. Uh -huh. And a lot of the corals, they do color up over time. Once they settle in and the parameters are all in good to shape, you'll find that most SPS corals will color up nicely. Now I noticed this, I don't know if it's a staghorn in the back or an acro with the blue tips. Right. Did, did that just start to develop blue tips? No, or did it I? had blue tips when I had it at home. It yeah, did? It did have blue tips. And you have that same colony at home? I used to have it, yeah. Do you see that rust up in the corner? Like they didn't glue that there. No, no, it settled from one of the spawns. Well, look how big that is. There were several of those. We actually removed a bunch of them because it was just starting to get dominated by these uh, facilitators. They spawned really easy and spread everywhere. Now as far as uh, like Nessarius snails, any of the sand sifting type things, do you have any of that in here? Yeah, we, we have snails, we have crabs in here. We have sea cucumber, the big black one that stretches out to almost 18 inches. The problem with snails and crabs is that harasses eat them now. Especially this peppermint crab. Yeah. He eats a lot of the crabs and he also probably eats some of the snails. But we are now all we have left is huge turbo snails that are the size of baseballs. That grew from really tiny small ones. But the thing is now, everything's anchored and glued and, and well established. They can't really knock anything over. So no, they don't they hurt anything. Knock anything over. Yeah. But at the same time, I mean, there's not much room for the big snails to move around either. And there's really not much algae, you know? No. I mean, other than the, we cleaned the glass when we got here this morning, and there really was just a, a light film on the glass. Well, there's a few patches here and there, but that'll always be there. One fish, fish can't reach them, and the algae will grow wherever the fish can't reach. So Sanjay, obviously flow is a critical aspect of keeping uh, specifically an SPS tank like this. So why don't you go over how you came up with the flow and what you've been using uh, to uh, control the different motions of the ocean in here, so to speak. A, yeah, flow is pretty important with all, with all the SPS corals for several reasons. One, corals don't move, so they have to have their food brought to them somehow. And water flow brings it. Secondly, all the waste products that they exude has to be removed from the coral vicinity. And once again, flow helps remove all that stuff. So with SPS corals, we already knew going into this that we would need a lot of flow. 
and not just a lot of flow, also kind of chaotic and random flow. So when we put in this tank, we have three closed loops that we built into this tank. So there's water being pulled from the back of the tank and just being dumped right back into the tank. We have three Iraqi 70s to provide that flow. Two of those are returned through sea swirls. So we have one inch sea swirls on either end of the tank in the front corners. And we use that sea swirl to basically provide us with the randomness in the water motion. So when it hits a steady stream, then it creates turbulence and also helps us change the direction of water flow. So all these outlets that you see are basically water coming in from the closed loops, which were all teed off and uh, fed back into the tank. And then we have one main circulation pump, that's an Iraqi 100, that's being used for to return water from the sump back into the tank. So what, what kind of GPA do we have going through the sea swirls? Roughly. These are one inch sea swirls, they're all being teed off. The Iraqi 70s will deliver somewhere 15. around 1,500 gallons yeah. per hour. So each one is on its own? Mm -hmm. They're uh, split. Uh, they're split. So it's 750. Somewhere seven, around. Yeah, you know, I mean, obviously age and elbows yeah. and 90s right. and head pressure. Right. So let's say 600 gallons an hour going through each. Yeah. Easily. But it's but the what I like about the one inch and the and the and the diameter is it's not pressure it's not tearing the polyps off it's yeah flow. that's the other nice you know? thing about having water flow that's not static especially when corals get that big mm -hmm. you'll find some parts of a tank if you carefully look at it you'll see that the static uh, returns have actually blown the tissue off the coral right. The sea swirl helps in that respect. At least the water moves around, doesn't get hit with the stream of high-powered jet all the time. And the one thing about the sea swirls is the fact that it, it's like that right speed, you know? Some of the different power heads, it's just, you know, there'll be time, but it's still too much, you know? Yeah, I like the fact that yeah. it moves slowly. Yeah, it, it's important. It's very important. Very, very, I, I, I look in this aquarium and I see water movement everywhere. I see every coral being affected by right. the flow. And that's what you're trying to do, but not being harmed by it. I also see we have some twinsies back there. Um, we, yeah, once the corals grew big, they, they, they start finding that yeah. the water flow gets reduced drastically. Yeah. So we actually had to then go in and try to add more, and it was easier to add extra pumps in there to create the water flow that we would need. Once again, if you look carefully, as the corals grew, you'll find that the Tunzi actually grew off the tissue off the coral. Yeah, and that's exactly what we're talking about. And are they on any control, or are they just wide open? They are actually on their own controller, and they actually pulse. But they're still tearing the tissue. They still are. Yep. Right. Yep. And we're just stating the facts. That's just the, the effect that it, these yeah, different mean, situations have had. Know, it's still a good motor, it provides a tremendous amount of flow, but the corals grew up corals into the grew motor. Up into the flow, yep. and they start getting affected. Yeah, because I guess that's. So when we first started off, the corals weren't that tall. Yeah. Now, as far as feeding, uh, how many times a day do these animals get fed? Typically, twice a day. We have student volunteers who will come in and feed once in the morning, one for a.m., and once in the p.m. Uh huh. And you just Typically, alternate it all the time, vary their diets, or pretty much consistent? Well, we, it's a mix. We feed them nori, then we feed them mices, cyclopes, some some dry flake food. Uh -huh. Pretty much mix it all up and then pour it in. Well, Sanjay, all the fish have a nice, healthy body shape. Like, you know, you look at fish, they're too thin, they get lateral line, you know, uh, and, and then what happens, with, they'll start to fight when they're just angry, hungry, but all the fish have really, really nice color. Um, you're obviously, you got it down to a science. There's no question about it. So maybe next we should take a look around back and uh, take a look at some of the equipment that uh, helps uh, take care of this aquarium. Okay? Sure.